Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, episode 359. I am your host, Nobilis Reed. This episode of Nobilis Erotica is sponsored by Circlet Press, the world's leading publisher of erotic science fiction and fantasy since 1992. Celebrate the erotic imagination with them at circlet.com. And we'll get to some of that sweet Circlet Press prose in a moment, but first, I have some really big news for you folks. Some of you may recall the Monster Whisperer serial I posted for purchasers of the Nobilis Erotica podcast app some time back. Well, that novel has been picked up by Circlet Press, and it's coming out on December 8th, including a brand new prequel story, Birth of a Monster Whisperer. Print on demand and audio editions will arrive soon thereafter. And we are having a special release event. I've teamed up with The Comfort Zone in College Park, Maryland, where I'm going to record a live in-person podcast episode. We'll have a live reading, a prize drawing, and maybe even a musical guest. And if you're not in the area, never fear, the event will also be streamed live. Check the podcast show notes for links and details. But now, let's get to the story. I am pleased to present Seduction of the Sea by T.K. Ashley. It originally appeared in Like Myth Made Flesh, Erotic Encounters with Mythical Beings, from Circlet Press. Originally from a small town in coastal Mississippi, T.K. Ashley has since traveled and lived all over the world, from rural Vermont to medieval Russian cities, from New Orleans to colonial Mexican towns. She enjoys writing in high fantasy, fairy tale, and historical fiction genres. She currently resides in Atlanta with her husband and two cats. Our narrator is Jada Adams, author, singer, world traveler, priestess, erstwhile podcaster, and all-around badass. The best way to find her online, if you have the stones for it, is to bring up jadaadams.com on your browser. Here we go. The Seduction of the Sea, written by T.K. Ashley. Narrated by Jada Adams. Lindsay sank back into the damp patch of clover and remarked upon her surroundings with satisfaction. The ground beneath her was springy with moss and pleasantly warmed by thick rays of sunshine. The white-barked ash trees surrounding her were well-built and of a size substantial enough to obscure the little meadow from view. A gentle breath of wind glided through their leaves, tinging the air with a hint of salt from the ocean. Just beyond the clearing, the merry bubbling out all unwelcome sound. It was tranquil, comfortable, and remote. Yes, every facet of this private oasis was ideal to her purposes, and Lindsay had to congratulate herself on its perfection. It would be the perfect place to murder a mermaid. Lindsay cheerfully plucked off the petals of a flower as she plodded, humming to herself as she pictured the mermaid's glassy eyes widening in terror her lips opening and closing in horror as Lindsay made her attack. Lindsay's revenge would be sweet but slow, and she wouldn't stop until the fish had croaked her last. The idea filled her with a tingling warmth that slithered up and down her spine. She closed her eyes as she indulged in the fantasy, giving a short gasp of longing with every petal she plucked, imagining that each was one of the mermaid's scales. How the bitch would scream with pain. Lindsay smiled and shifted lazily in the grass, stretching her arms up and clasping her hands behind her head in satisfaction. She was just weighing over what manner of weapon she ought to use to stab the little beast when a voice in the near distance rang out in a sing-song. Is that mischief I smell? Farewell, farewell. Is that trouble I hear? Stand clear, stand clear. Is that wicked I taste? Make haste, make haste. The high, clear voice reverberated all around her until she found she couldn't determine from which direction it came. She sat up on her elbows and powdered her lips in a pretty frown, tossing her long, blonde hair from side to side as she sought out the source of the voice. Who's there? she called out with irritation. The echo of a snicker met her ears. Lindsay crushed the remains of the hapless flower in her fist. That better not be who I think it is. Silence was her only answer. Show yourself, she demanded, gathering the gauzy muslin of her skirts and rising to her knees. Make me, 
a tiny voice taunted. Lindsay swung her head over to the sizable elm tree to her left and smiled. He'd betrayed his location. She grabbed for a rock, screwed up one side of her lip in concentration, and then threw the rock with all of her strength at the tree's upper branches. To her satisfaction, the voice issued a violent grunt of pain. Then a small, limp mass barreled through the leaves towards the ground, where it landed in an ungainly heap. Ha! Lindsay exclaimed in triumph. She leaped up and ran to the crumpled figure's side, where she looked down upon it with not the slightest speck of pity. At her feet, the injured sprite groaned and rolled over onto his back, bringing a tiny hand up to his mop of wildly red hair and examining his little skull for injury. In everything, he was a miniature. The breadth and length of his limbs could stretch no further than the span of Lindsay's outstretched hand, and he had sharp, delicate features that might have been carved with the point of pin. All of his parts were harmonious in proportion, but his eyes, great green eyes that turned up at the corner like a cat's, were entirely too large for such a small face. Currently, those eyes regarded Lindsay with anger. I liked you better when it was only my feelings you sought to injure, he pronounced. Lindsay tilted her head. I can't recall ever liking you. The sprite made an indignant noise much too loud for his slight frame, and the force of its shock reverberating through him left him dazed. Lindsay snorted, then, intent on her original purpose, swallowed her amusement. I told you not to spy on me, Egan. You're lucky I didn't do any worse to you. I reckon I am lucky, since you're already plotting one murder today. Egan lifted himself unsteadily to his feet and set to brushing off the back of his pants. Lindsay concealed her surprise. I don't know what you're talking about. Egan's eyes flashed to hers darkly. I can smell mischief a league away, he said, then lowered his eyes to the cleft between her legs, where the thin fabric of her skirt had clung and gathered during her movement. Among other things and the scent of your mischief is especially pungent. Lindsay spluttered, too mortified to speak. Self-conscious, she shook out her skirt so that it no longer clung to her legs, but to her humiliation, the slight friction only furthered her discomfort. She clamped her thighs together, hoping that would settle the matter. So who are you planning to kill? Egan asked casually, as if he were inquiring as to whom she planned to invite to her next dinner party. Lindsay's embarrassment was soon forgotten. That little fish bitch, she said through clenched teeth. Who? Darissa? Egan asked, looking up at her curiously. Why? There were so many reasons. Everything about her was odious, from the way her voice rang like wind chimes to the impossible length of her eyelashes to the infuriating buoyancy of her round, perky... Now that smells like jealousy, Egan observed. Lindsay balked. I am not jealous of her. Oh, hmm, perhaps I was wrong. Egan wrinkled his nose, then grinned up at her wickedly. Maybe it's lust I'm smelling. Lindsay reached down to throttle the sprite, but he deftly leapt aside, laughing merrily. It's true, it's true, he whooped with delight and clapped his little hands together. Lindsay sank to her knees, her arms crossed in a chokingly tight vice across her breasts, the peaks of which were traitorously hardened by his suggestion. It is not true, she bit out. Though I'm probably the only person in the whole damned village not taken in by her. Lindsay, a pretty girl in her own right, was not used to being ignored. But ever since the mermaid Nerissa had taken up roost in the neighboring cove, Lindsay couldn't even attract an extended handshake from a man, much less anything more satisfying. Mm Mm-hmm. So not jealousy and not lust are the reasons you've taken off work to plot her demise alone in this meadow. You're right. This is probably the best excuse for a sick day that I can think of, Egan said. What's the point in opening the shop? What need has anyone for potions when there's a mermaid spell to fall under? Besides, Master Talus hasn't been in-house in weeks, and the most I can muster without his supervision is wart salve. Like the rest of the men, and even some women in the village, Master Talus spent his days down at the cove, mooning and fawning over Nerissa as she played a song on her harp or combed her long raven hair.' 
All semblances of production and commerce were shut down, and the village was propelled back into the Dark Ages, its people content to subsist on wild berries and the sweet sound of Nerissa's voice. It made Lindsay sick. Hey, people need Ward South, Egan argued. Maybe, but they don't need me. Lindsay looked around for another flower to dismember, found none, and settled for ripping up random fistfuls of grass. Egan frowned. To be fair, I doubt they need Nerissa very much either. By the resulting hiss Lindsay uttered, Egan surmised that he had answered wrongly. I mean to say, he amended quickly, that they need you a lot more than they need Nerissa. You're useful. You help people. She's just a pretty bauble to look at. People don't want to be helped. People want to be flattered, which Nerissa does every time she swings that ridiculous mane of hair over one fishy shoulder and titters that gurgly laugh at someone's bad joke. People want Nerissa. They don't want me. Egan considered questioning her as to how exactly Nerissa's grisly murder would sway more people to Lindsay's favor, but decided on a different route of discourse. That's not true. I want you, he said. Lindsay dropped the fistful of mutilated grass. You do? she asked, almost suspiciously. Her sky-blue eyes narrowed to slits as she watched him for signs of deceit. He shrugged his shoulders as if this information ought to be obvious. Of course I do. You're smart, beautiful, oh so fun to be around, and besides, your mischief smells the sweetest. Egan's quick reflexes allowed him to avoid a backhand from Lindsay. However, the resulting wind from her swift movement knocked him clear onto his back. Will you stop trying to injure me? He protested from the ground. Mercy, is it any wonder you chase people away with an attitude like that? I was paying you a compliment. Keep your compliments to yourself, Lindsay grumbled as she cracked her knuckles, which were sore from being held in fists too long. Egan sat up on his elbows. Easy, Lindsay. Don't you ever relax? Lindsay thought bitterly of how much more she'd be relaxing had he not intruded on her privacy. Yes, I do relax. When I'm alone. Oh, come on, sweets. You're too tense. Let me rub your shoulders. No. Your feet? Not even if you had normal-sized hands. Your mischief? His green eyes twinkled naughtily. Lindsay flushed. Don't be disgusting, Egan. You're, she gestured inadequately with her hand, incredibly tiny. I bet I could fit your relevant bit in my mouth. He waggled his eyebrows suggestively. Lindsay made an exasperated noise. I'm not that desperate. Thanks for asking. Actually, she was that desperate. Lindsay hadn't so much as touched another person in almost a month. If you don't count the swollen glands of Master Talus' patience, and even that intimate contact produced nothing more than a polite tip of the patient's hat. What? You don't think I could please you? You're joking, right? Lindsay wasn't sure if he was teasing her or just being thick. I've had dildos bigger than you. What are you planning to do? Go spelunking in my crevice while you juggle your own bits? Nice try, Egan. I'd rather fuck the fish. Oh, I bet you would. Egan laughed uproariously, the high-pitched sound tinny and mocking to Lindsay's ears. Ha ha. Just, just leave me alone. Lindsay turned around her face bright red with anger, embarrassment, and frustration. Egan stopped laughing. I'm serious, you know. I can pleasure you, he said, his tone ripe with promises. Lindsay was almost revolted at herself, at the thrill that passed through her body at his words. Don't you have a fairy to fondle or something? She joked, but her voice was muffled in her ears, overpowered by the sudden hammering of her heart. Close your eyes. Lindsay shivered unbidden at his words, which seemed to be spoken right behind her ear. She didn't know why, but she obeyed him, fluttering her eyelids closed uncertainly and shifting awkwardly in place. All right, she said gamely, but if I turn around and you're naked, I'll decapitate you with my teeth. He laughed, but the sound was so much deeper and louder than usual that she half wondered if someone else had come into the clearing. She opened her eyes. Egan? She called uncertainly, 
as she sensed a presence looming behind her. Yes, a pleasant tenor asked, its warm mouth exploring the outer shell of her ear. Lindsay screamed and whirled around, only to be caught in the arms of a man who looked strangely like Egan, only in proper normal man proportions. Relax, human Egan laughed, his smile broadening to a grin. It's me, sweets. She stared at him in shock, her jaw gaping as she struggled to comprehend. It was Egan, and yet he was someone else entirely. She never would have seen how truly handsome he was at his former size. His unruly red hair fell at uneven lengths down to the angle of his pointed jaw. His features were delicate, almost feminine, but the cut of his mouth was rougher, fuller. Even though he was kneeling, she could see his lean body easily outmeasured her in height. His shirt had been spun of spider silk and fell open casually at the neck, revealing a smooth chest that, while not broad, was hardened with strength. His pants, woven from dried flax, molded naturally to the long line of his legs and were fastened around his narrow hips by what must have been twine in its original dimensions, but now looked like the thick riggings of a ship. She found herself staring at the conspicuous swell of fabric beneath the line of his belt, and couldn't help wondering whether the same transformation in size that had been applied to the rest of his body had manifested there as well. His green eyes, still curiously large for his face, turned a deep emerald as he watched her take in his appearance, and his gaze seemed to penetrate straight through the flimsy fabric of her dress. Everything is in proportion, he said, answering her unspoken question. Some proportions being more generous than others. He lowered his voice conspiratorially as he said, I'm talking about my cock, of course. Lindsay was too curious to be angry with him for trying to discomfort her. But how did you... She started to ask, puzzling out how this alteration had come about. She had, of course, seen Egan perform any number of magical pranks before, but she had never even known he was capable of such large-scale magic, much less been witness to it. I have a lot of tricks up my sleeve, he said. He twirled her in his arms and pulled her back against his chest, parting his legs to settle between his thighs. You just never care to see them. His embrace was so warm and inviting that Lindsay couldn't help but sink back into his arms, which surrounded her with the tangy aromas of grass and leaves and bark, all manner of scents that made her feel as if she were leaning back against the trunk of a tree instead of a man. Oh, she said lamely, giving herself over a little to his seduction. Her eyes drifted closed as Egan's new human-sized hands moved to her shoulders and began to massage away the hardened knots beneath her skin. But I've never seen you... She began to protest. Shh, he said, his breath passing lightly over her ear. Don't worry about me. Why don't you tell me why Nerissa's got a bee in your bonnet? Did she steal your bow? But Lindsay couldn't help but worry about Egan, as his capable fingers slid down from her shoulders to caress along the underside of her collarbones. I don't have a bow, she said, willing her voice to be calmer than she felt. Egan had tucked his face into the hollow of her shoulder as he worked his fingers in slow, wide arcs that drifted ever downward over the plane of her breastbone, and his breath became warm and teasing against the side of her neck. Lindsay's voice caught slightly as she kept talking. It's not just because she's beautiful. Her eyes flew open as one of Egan's fingers skimmed the top of her bodice, but she continued. I can't stand the way she's manipulating the whole village. They'd starve to death before they'd leave her side. It's a mercy that she goes to bed at sea to rest at night. Otherwise, they'd all have wasted away to nothing. And you're the only one who realizes this? Egan mumbled against her neck his lips brushing against her skin, not quite in a kiss, but not quite by accident either. I must be, Lindsay admitted, her eyelids drooping. Egan was spinning some kind of magic around her. She could feel it enveloping and exploring her, but she didn't care. It felt so good. At least if anyone else notices, they aren't doing anything about it. So what are you going to do about it?
Egan was fingering the bow at the neckline of Lindsay's gown. He pulled the threading apart delicately, allowing the garment to bloom open over her breasts, which sat high and tense with anticipation. Stop her, Lindsay gasped as Egan peeled open the open neckline of her gown down her shoulders, fully exposing her breasts, before she hurts anyone else. How? Egan prodded, taking her earlobe delicately between his teeth. Lindsay was keenly aware of Egan's hand as it made its torturous way down the center of her breastbone. Well, first, I'll drag her to the clearing, or I'll pin her down by her hands and flippers, then I'll get out my assortment of rocks and pointed sticks. Mm-hmm, Egan mumbled absently. He palmed one of her breasts, weighing it in his hand thoughtfully as he listened to her plan of attack. Suppose she resists. I hear mermaid teeth are quite sharp. He pinched Lindsay's nipple, earning a surprised cry of pain from her. Suppose she bites you, he said, opening his jaw over the tender line of her throat. Lindsay suppressed a gurgle of approval. She won't. I'll gag her with her own hair if I have to. Then you won't be able to hear her scream. Egan covered her other breast, kneading and squeezing the pair of them together and apart, then roughly pulling and pinching her nipples between his fingers, or beg for mercy. Lindsay felt her mouth fall slack as Egan groped her openly. She let her hands drop down to his knees on either side of her, her own legs parting as she relaxed. The air around her clouded with the magic Egan was weaving, and she breathed it in deeply, gratefully. She could feel desire creeping through her veins like a drug, spreading from the crown of her head down the lengths of her arms, over the tips of her breasts and Egan's capable hands, and across the plane of her stomach, where it suddenly bottomed out and rushed headlong to her eager sex. Egan, she gasped out, begging for mercy herself as her arousal pulled warm and slick between her legs. Shh, we were talking about Nerissa, not me, he said, as if she could ignore his hands moving down her waist. He gripped her hips and pulled her back hard against the unmistakable bulge of his stiffened cock. What do you want to do to her when she's tied up and at your fearsome mercy? Lindsay reflected on this scenario with pleasure. She imagined Nerissa's hands tied above her head, displaying her perfect breasts to their best advantage as they heaved with her gasps of fear. The very idea set the inner walls of her pussy to a pulse. Lindsay was taken aback momentarily by her own reaction. She wanted to punish the mermaid, not pleasure her. Then Lindsay relaxed when she realized that this was probably just part of Egan's naughty spell. Bastard. All the same, something had to be done about this maddening need. She tried to push back against Egan's cock to encourage him to touch her some more, but he kept his hands and her hips firmly in place, waiting for her to answer. Then I'll stab her straight through her scaly heart, Lindsay said, placing her hands over Egan's and trying to push them down lower to where she needed them most. Through her heart? but what a waste of such great little tits. As he spoke, he shook off Lindsay's hands and lifted his own to caress her breasts again. No, you'll have to stab her elsewhere. Appeased slightly by his course of action, she tried again for the right answer. Through her slimy gut then. But she wasn't thinking of stabbing the mermaid as she pictured Nerissa's taut abdomen in her mind. Instead, inexplicably, she imagined placing her own hands around the narrow circle of her waist and drawing her closer. As if he were privy to her thoughts, Egan's hands mimicked Lindsay's in her peculiar fantasy, leaving her breasts and smoothing down over what remained of her bodice over her stomach. Very intimate, he remarked, beginning to gather the fabric of her dress between his fingers, inching it higher and higher up her calves. But also on the messy side. Have you ever gutted a fish? Not the easiest thing to clean up. You'll have scales under your nails for weeks. Lindsay was beginning to detect a correlation between her own suggestion and Egan's hands, and so she schemed desperately for a way to guide his fingers to a more satisfying location. 
Then I guess I'll just have to stab her up her fishy slit, she blurted out, her cheeks immediately coloring as she realized how ridiculous that sounded. She wasn't even sure mermaids had slits. You're beginning to sound rather ghoulish, sweets. When a woman says she wants to stab another woman in the muff, it's enough to put one off one's breakfast. Egan reached with his fingertips to the newly exposed flesh of Lindsay's knees and began to trail them upwards. What do you suppose mermaid bits even taste like? Egan asked, seizing upon a more palatable subject. I imagine it's rather like gargling sardines. If I were you, I'd just ask her to go down on you instead. Lindsay cried out both in protest and pleasure as Egan's fingers whispered over the swollen folds of her sex and then retreated back down her leg. I didn't say anything about tasting anyone's bits, she said, twisting awkwardly in his arms to glare at him. Maybe not, he said slyly, but you're thinking about it now. The corners of his unnaturally large eyes crinkled with laughter. And I bet your mischief tastes sweet. He brought one of his hands to the back of her head and guided her face to his in a kiss. Despite her annoyance with him, Lindsay couldn't resist the tender brush of his mouth against hers, so she gave in, turning herself further in his embrace to wrap an arm around his neck. The sprite's lips were as rough and demanding as they were pliant, his kiss spiced with wild mint and sun-warmed clover. As he moved his tongue to part her lips, his nimble fingers spread the folds of her sex, seeking the hardened bud of her clitoris. Lindsay moaned into his mouth as he stroked her, just once, and Egan's spell was complete. She would gladly consent to betting a whole pot of mermaids if it meant she could just have more of this feeling right this minute. She broke the kiss and pushed him back onto the mossy ground, scrambling to move on top of him despite the cumbersome burden of her skirts. Don't say a fucking thing, she snapped in response to the immediately self-satisfied expression on Egan's face as he watched her fumble open the rope belt at his waist. She felt her hand inside his pants for the rigid length of his cock, and something inside her long-neglected sex twitched in response. Give me something to do with my mouth. And I won't say a word, he promised, sliding his tongue over his lips in a lewd suggestion. He moved his hand to cover her fingers around his cock and added, I can take care of this end. At this point, Lindsay would have been willing to hump a walrus to soothe the aching need between her legs, so finding an excuse to wipe that cocksure grin off Egan's face was only an added bonus in favor of this course of action. She returned his wicked smile and crawled over his torso on her hands and knees, stopping above his shoulders and bunching up her skirts into two wads by her waist. She planted her knees on either side of his head and waited, with heart-pounding anticipation, for him to make the next move. He turned his face to one side and nuzzled the inside of her thigh, breathing in deeply. Oh, sweet mischief, were the last words he uttered before setting his mouth to the task of pleasuring her. Ah, oh, Lindsay cried as his tongue swept up the length of her slit and curled a teasing loop around her clitoris. She found she much preferred this application of his wagging tongue to his earlier teasing, even more so because she couldn't see his mocking face under the bunch of her skirts. And so she was free to imagine whatever she liked between her thighs, whichever tongue she pleased flicking back and forth over her bud being worried to a frenzy beneath whomever's lips she desired. To her shock, the only such person she could think of in this context was the mermaid Nerissa. You bitch, Lindsay hissed to herself, to Egan, to Nerissa. Egan must be making her think this way, for surely such an idea could never have come from her own mind. Yet even the thought of Nerissa's salty tongue lapping at her pussy didn't stop Lindsay from gently lifting and dropping her hips over Egan's mouth, grinding herself against his skilled tongue. Now she imagined it was Nerissa's hand groping her backside. Now she imagined it was Nerissa's hand groping her backside, sliding her fingers towards the entrance of Lindsay's throbbing sex. You bitch! Lindsay repeated in a growl even as she leaned forward to grant better access to what she knew were Egan's fingers. Egan made a throaty sound, halfway between a laugh and a moan, as he worked his cock to a lather in the grip of his free hand. 
He urged her faster with his tongue as he pumped two fingers mercilessly in and out of her, and he smiled privately to himself as she abandoned all pretense and began to cry out in earnest. Her thighs were tense and trembling on either side of his face as he curled his fingers inside her pussy, bringing her screaming to a shuddering halt above him. Lindsay collapsed forward onto her hands, her breath coming in the hard, heart-pounding gasps of the recently satisfied. She spread her legs wider as she felt Egan squirming underneath her, lifting her chest to allow him to wriggle up so that their faces were even. That was... She hesitated, wondering how much gratitude she was compelled to bestow upon someone she normally found so bothersome. Not over yet, he finished for her, arching his hips high and hard as he guided his cock between her overheated folds and into her passage. Lindsay gasped as his thick member filled her, and she dropped and angled her hips to better accommodate him. The aftershocks of her climax caused her walls to contract pleasurably around his cock as he worked it in deeper. Nerissa, she moaned, and he didn't correct her. Nerissa's bewitching face and breasts and tongue were soon forgotten as Egan clutched her hips and thrust harder and faster up into her. Lindsay lowered her face to watch him, her blonde hair tumbling around them and trapping them in a private embrace. Whether it was his spell or his cock working its magic over her, Lindsay couldn't stop staring at Egan's handsome face as it twisted with unvoiced pleasure. She found herself throwing her hips back against his, trying to unnerve him as much as he had her. Her blue eyes lit up with triumph as he groaned beneath her, and she clenched her sex firmly around his cock as it stiffened and he spilled into her. No sooner had Lindsay leaned in to trail a post-coital kiss behind Egan's ear than she found herself flat on her face with a mouthful of moss. She spat violently and lifted herself on her elbows, looking around with bewilderment. What the hell? she wondered aloud. Over here, a small voice said, and she whipped her head down to the ground near her left elbow, where the little sprite sat gulping in as much air as his tiny lungs could hold. Sorry. That tends to happen if I try to hold human form for too long, he said, his tone deflated. The spell was broken. Lust left her and irritation returned. Why did you make me think those things about Nerissa? She demanded angrily, reaching to put her dress to rights as quickly as her shaking fingers would allow. The fog of Egan's magic had cleared from her mind, replaced instead by a grating headache. He grinned up at her, making no move to cover what parts of him were still exposed. I thought you'd thank me for that, he said, with a shrug of his shoulders. Flustered, Lindsay clung to her rage to spare her dignity. Why would you think I wanted anything of the kind? I want to kill that creature, not romance it. She stood up and immediately her annoyance was renewed by the sensation of Egan's sticky release oozing down the inside of her thigh. How could she have willingly lain with someone so insufferable? She wasn't sure the skill of his amorous attentions outweighed the humiliation of his taunting. I'm not entirely sure you know what it is you want, Egan said, finally reaching down to tie his belt closed. All I know is that while I can suggest quite a lot, I can't make you do anything. So, he said, hopping lightly to his feet and clapping his hands together authoritatively, Let's get a move on, shall we? We've got to seek how to slay and only a few more hours of daylight to do it. Come on. I know a shop that sells silver-tipped daggers at a reasonable sum. Egan bent his knees and gave a mighty leap, sending him soaring with unnatural agility to the lowest branch of the elm tree. All right, Lindsay grumbled as she followed after him. As he flitted from branch to branch in the trees ahead of her, she tried to sort out the tangle of emotions running through her. What Egan had said was true. She wasn't sure what she wanted anymore. Nerissa was evil. Of that she was certain. But why did she feel such an unholy attraction to the mermaid? Lindsay couldn't decide whether she wanted more to kill her or kiss her. An indecision soured like indigestion in her gut. One thing was clear. Only one of them would leave the encounter alive. The shore was a dark, wriggling mass at sunset. 
The people of Lindsay's village were crammed together over every available space the narrow, rocky beach could afford. They were, of the main, unwashed, their clothing disheveled, and their bodies and faces blended together in one indiscriminate mass of slackened jaws and watching eyes. Half a league away, their boats bobbed untended in the harbor, their fishing nets left dried and unused in the fading sun. The villagers sat still, some swaying slightly, some humming along, their entire being focused on the mermaid Nerissa. She perched on a low rock formation in the center of the cove. Her long Piscean tail curled around the rock's base and dipped in the water, its length glittering with dull pewter scales that reflected the sheen of the darkening ocean. Her heavy drape of black hair was twisted into a loose braid over one shoulder and was dotted with jewels and flower petals she had plucked from her admirer's offings. Her spindly fingers picked a tune from the harp budded between her small breasts as she sang a haunting melody in words that no one understood. Behind her, the sun slowly sank towards its watery bed for the night. Lindsay hesitated at the edge of the woods, half concealed by the trunk of a large oak, and watched the scene before her with despair. I'll wait for you here, Egan informed her, settling into a high knot on the tree's trunk. Lindsay snapped her eyes away from the mermaid and up to the sprite. What? she asked, her pitch heightened to a squeak. You're just going to let me go alone? All the determination she'd mustered in the clearing was starting to waver. In her trembling hands, a velvet purse shook slightly. Fancy lot of good I'd do you if I did go. My magic doesn't work outside of the forest, and with my luck, Lady Mackerel will mistake me for a minnow and have me for a midnight snack, he said with a shudder, then reconsidered. Although, there are worse things than going down such a beautiful throat. Am I right? Even in the face of this serious situation, Egan started snickering. Lindsay was very sorry that the sprite was not within striking distance. Is it at all possible for you to be serious, even for just a small second, such as when your friend is about to meet her doom? She ventured a nervous glance back to the mermaid, who had finished her song and was bowing graciously to the overwhelming applause of her captive audience. Egan brightened. Oh, so now I'm a friend? The idea seemed to please him. Very well. I shall be sorry to see you die, Lindsay. Perhaps you'd favor me with a goodbye kiss? He squeezed his oversized eyes shut and pronounced his lips in a melodramatic pucker. Lindsay ignored him, pleaded with what gods may be to protect her, and took a step out of the forest. Good luck! Egan's tiny voice called after her, and, to Lindsay's surprise, he sounded sincere. She gripped the velvet pouch a little tighter as she walked towards the gathered crowd. No one even turned to look at her as she gently nudged them aside. Their eyes focused, as Lindsay's were, on Nerissa. But Nerissa was not so blind. She set down her harp and swung her braid over her other shoulder, her olive-green eyes narrowing with interest over Lindsay. Who are you? Lindsay was physically startled as the mermaid's high, melodious voice echoed strangely between her ears. Nerissa's lips never moved. Every face in the crowd turned suddenly to Lindsay. Among them, she saw the familiar features of her old friends and neighbors. She could see Master Talus was there as well, but something in their looks was alien. Lindsay felt a chill pass through her that was unwarranted by the mild sea breeze. Their cheeks had become lean and hard with fatigue and hunger. Their hollow eyes reflected nothing of their former selves. Who are you? The mermaid insisted. She sat up a little higher on her rock perch and coiled her tail closer to her body, the wide fan of its fin twitching with annoyance. Even in her displeasure, she was lovely to behold. She could have been sculpted from the stone itself for as proudly as she held herself. Yet for as hard as her features were, they were offset by the softness of her mouth and the depth of her gaze, which held one captive with all the gravity of a gorgon. 
She was perfection and poison molded neatly in one. Lindsay could not rip her eyes away from the beautiful creature, and so it was blindly that she reached into the velvet pouch she carried. She has a weapon! Someone yelled with alarm. Stop her! All at once, the crowd surged inward on Lindsay, and she raised her hands over her head in defense. Wait! She cried. It is a gift! Indeed, clutched in one of Lindsay's unsteady hands was an object. Come here! The mermaid said aloud, her speaking voice heavily accented, as if rusty from disuse. The crowd made no move to part for her, so Lindsay had to elbow her way through the throngs of people to get to the water's edge, where an unseen pair of hands shoved her hard towards the rising surf. She slipped, and the crowd behind her laughed cruelly as she plunged headfirst into the shallow water. Lindsay rose to her feet with what decorum she could muster, and the brackish water that dripped down her body heated to a boil with the rising temperature of her anger. The object in her hand remained intact, and she gripped it tighter with resolve. What gift do you bring me? The mermaid Derissa asked with no little curiosity. Her eyes scanned Lindsay's body with undiscriminating severity, pausing over the bodice of her dress, which now clung wet and translucent to her breasts. Lindsay's disloyal body responded with enthusiasm to Nerissa's inspection, her nipples hardening to dark points beneath the thin, wet fabric of her dress as she waded slowly through the water. Her skirts floated up and formed an unceremonious train behind her as she marched forward as a bride to the devil's altar. But Lindsay was no longer afraid as she approached the mermaid's rock. Instead, a cool thrill of anticipation rose higher and higher within her, as did the level of cold seawater, which at first came up to her knees, then to her thighs, and then lapped teasingly against the mouth of her sex. Her earlier romp with Egan had done nothing but wet her appetite, but this, she, was the main course she'd been craving. The tide washed a taunting wave over her belly as she came to a stop before the mermaid's rock, and Lindsay waited for Nerissa to make the next move. Nerissa smiled at her knowingly as she slithered down from her perch and glided into the water. You don't answer me, she said privately in Lindsay's mind. You are afraid of me. The mermaid came to a stop in front of Lindsay, treading water as easily as if she were standing the fan of her tail brushing Lindsay's bare ankles as it moved. Nerissa reached out with her long, delicate fingers and pushed back a lock of Lindsay's hair, causing a slight tremor to pass through the pair of them. You are different than the other humans, Nerissa observed, obviously as surprised by her own reaction to Lindsay as the other woman was by hers. Lindsay nearly dropped the object in her hand as Nerissa continued to explore the contours of her face with her fingertips. Gone were her plans to confront the mermaid in front of the crowd, to demand she account for the wrongs she had committed against the village, and to threaten her with violence should she choose to continue in her torment. Lindsay's mouth struggled to speak the words she'd intended, but the only words she could choke out were, You're very beautiful. This delighted the mermaid, who rewarded her by dipping one of her graceful fingers between Lindsay's parted lips. To Lindsay's dismay, she found herself licking and sucking the mermaid's fingertip, relishing the salty taste of her skin. Nerissa closed her eyes briefly and hummed with approval, then repeated her question, What gift have you brought me? The mermaid spread her other hand over Lindsay's closed fist by her side. Before Lindsay could protest, Nerissa had pried open her fingers and taken the object from her. Both women looked down at Nerissa's open palm, where an intricately carved comb of ivory lay, its handle crusted with tiny flowers wrought of rose gold and pearls. Its tines flashed unmistakably like silver in the setting sun. The mermaid looked up at Lindsay, her olive eyes darkening with realization. You meant to hurt me? She said, 
but her tone was flavored more with disappointment than anger. Lindsay didn't reply, suddenly ashamed of her previous bloodlust. Her heart thudded with dread at what method of punishment the mermaid might choose to inflict upon her. She thought back to the craven little sprite, Egan, waiting for her in the big oak tree, and half regretted not accepting his offer of a goodbye kiss. To her astonishment, Nerissa made no move to censure her. Instead, the mermaid turned her head to one side and smoothed back a few strands of loose hair. Will you put it on? she asked, holding out the ivory comb to Lindsay. The small request was as unexpected as it was impossible to deny. Lindsay stepped closer to the mermaid, her breasts tightening with the knowledge that they were but inches from Nerissa's pert tits, which glistened enticingly with the spray of the crashing surf. Lindsay raised her hand, which remained admirably steady, to take the small comb from Nerissa's palm and slide it into place above the mermaid's ear. As she was bringing her hand back down, she couldn't help but slide it over the silky braid of the mermaid's hair, her hand pausing at the braid's tip over Nerissa's waist. The crowd, who, unable to hear any of their silent conversation, had been watching with increasing anxiety, cried out in protest as Lindsay's hand touched the mermaid's satiny skin. You can't touch her, someone shouted, and a few made signs of moving forward to stop her. Nerissa turned to them sharply and hissed, her eyes ferocious and commanding. The crowd demurred, but Lindsay could still feel the heat of their glares on the back of her head. The mermaid turned back to Lindsay with the trace of a smile on her lips. You are curious, she said, stepping closer to Lindsay in encouragement. As am I. With Nerissa's implied permission, Lindsay lifted her hands in awe to cup the mermaid's small breasts, marveling as she brushed her thumbs over the erect nipples at how she could have ever fantasized about marring them with a dagger. The mermaid arched into her touch, and Lindsay rolled her nipples between her fingers in response. She was amazed at Nerissa's reaction to her. Could such an enchanting creature as Nerissa really desire her? When the mermaid made no indication of objecting, Lindsay lowered her hands next to Nerissa's flat belly, taking pleasure in the way her slick skin yielded to her gentle touch. As she traced the indentation of Nerissa's navel with one thumb, she was horrified that she had ever dreamed of splitting this magnificent skin in anger. She recounted her next suggested point of attack, Nerissa's sex, and blushed immediately. And yet... Her curious hand drifted lower once more, beneath the line of the water and over the smooth scales below Nerissa's waist. She hesitated with her hand resting over the place a human pubis would lay. I am as much a woman as you are, Nerissa responded mutely to her unvoiced question, guiding Lindsay's fingers with her own down to the small slit where the mermaid's scales parted. She may have looked like a fish, but Lindsay found only the heated flesh of a woman beyond the opening. With awe, she dipped her fingers into a woman's tight passage and swept her thumb over a woman's clitoral bud. Nerissa gave a gasp of pleasure and bucked into the other woman's hand as she stroked her slowly, experimentally, under the cover of the water. Only without legs, Nerissa continued her own hand moving between Lindsay's thighs underwater. She touched the fabric over Lindsay's pussy with wonder. Do you really have hair there? Lindsay could answer only in a quiet moan. She wrapped her free arm around Nerissa's waist to support herself as the mermaid's hand found its way beneath Lindsay's skirt to explore her further. The pair of them, must have appeared to be locked in a bizarre embrace to the onlookers back on the shore, who were not privy to the succession of stroking and petting and pinching occurring beneath the rising waves. It was like making love to the ocean herself, as each undulation of Nerissa's body against Lindsay's rocked her back and forth like the tide, rendering her as relaxed and weightless as a boy adrift at sea.
She felt Nerissa's body begin to tremble in her arms, and then the mermaid cried out. She threw both of her arms around Lindsay's neck as her orgasm overcame her, her pussy clenching around Lindsay's fingers, her powerful tail wrapped around one of Lindsay's legs. Lindsay brought both hands up to either side of the mermaid's face and leaned down to kiss her, the salty taste of her mouth doing nothing to quench the burning want in the pit of her own belly. Nerissa returned the kiss with passion, her cool tongue soft and probing as it moved against Lindsay's. The grip of her arms relaxed, and her hands moved down to caress Lindsay's body. Lindsay sighed and drew her hands down the mermaid's cheeks to her neck. Suddenly she gasped and pulled away from the mermaid's kiss. Nerissa looked back at her wildly, confused, her lips still parted and flushed with pleasure. Beneath the line of the mermaid's jaw, Lindsay felt two slender gills. Comprehension crashed over Lindsay like a tidal wave. All the while, Egan had taunted her in the meadow about Nerissa's anatomy. He had known. He had known that the mermaid would use seduction as her weapon of choice. And he had known that stabbing her in the chest, the gut, or anywhere else would be ineffectual. The mermaid's weakness lay in her gills. Anger and revulsion swept through her at the mermaid's cunning. In seconds, Lindsay had ripped the silver-tipped comb from the mermaid's hair and pinned the creature back against the rock. Nerissa, still sluggish from her climax, did not have time to react and only emitted a startled whimper as Lindsay pressed the comb threateningly against her throat. You tricked me, Lindsay spat out with venom but I know your weakness now. Behind them, the crowd murmured with unease, but unable to tell whether intervening would earn them a rebuke from Nerissa or not, they elected to stay in place. Nerissa choked and coughed as Lindsay covered one gill with the handle of the comb. Don't do this, the mermaid protested. I did not trick you. The fire that had been in her eyes earlier had died down and real fear replaced it. Please. The big, bad, wicked mermaid was begging her for mercy. Something inside of Lindsay broke at the mermaid's pleading, and a dull ache rose up in her throat. She couldn't do this. Maybe it was selfish, but she couldn't bring herself to take something so beautiful from the world. You've wronged this village, Lindsay said her voice tremulous with feeling. She brought her other hand up to cup the mermaid's face. I know, the mermaid said, leaning into Lindsay's touch. I'm sorry. Lindsay had trouble believing the mermaid was truly sorry. You have to leave, she insisted, even as her own heart sank. I know, Nerissa agreed. Impulsively, she leaned forward to give Lindsay's lips one more kiss, and Lindsay dropped the comb, knowing she'd never use it to harm the mermaid. Nerissa pulled away from Lindsay and turned to the shocked onlookers, who knew not what to think. I must leave you, Nerissa announced in her stilted voice. The crowd protested violently, but she held up one slim hand to quiet them. Goodbye. Together with the crowd, Lindsay watched helplessly as Nerissa gathered her harp and began to swim to the cove's entrance. Just before she disappeared beneath the ocean's waves, she looked back at Lindsay, her sad eyes flaring up with sudden ardor. I'll be back, she promised, one side of her mouth quirking up with amusement. But only for you. Lindsay's sex still ached with an unattained release and the promise in Nerissa's eyes sizzled straight through her. She did her best to return the mermaid's smile through her discomfort, but as soon as Nerissa ducked her ebony head beneath the water, Lindsay hurried back to shore, navigating her way past the dazed villagers who had woken from the spell in confusion. She hurried past them before they could question her, on a mission to find Egan. The little sprite was clucking with disapproval when she found him, well, isn't that wonderful? 
You know this is going to do nothing to quell those rumors that you'll sleep with anything. She considered pointing out that his insult didn't reflect well on him either, then thought better of it and smiled sweetly. Egan, follow me. I'm in the mood for mischief. The sprite jumped up as if his pants had been lit on fire. Why didn't you say so in the first place? He exclaimed, jumping off the branch and into Lindsay's waiting palm. She rolled her eyes. Much as she hated to admit it, if she expected to survive until Nerissa's return with her sanity intact, she was going to need a helping hand, however tiny. But I'm really going to have to insist you wash your hand off first, sweets. Egan wrinkled up his little nose in disgust. It smells of live bait. Lindsay tucked the ivory comb down the front of her bodice with a free hand. You'd better get used to it, she said with a private smile daydreaming about a brilliant pair of olive green eyes. And there you have it. Did you like this story? Tell me what you think by calling the voicemail line, sending an email, or finding me on Twitter. All those ways to contact me can be found on the podcast website at nobilis.libson.com. And here is your Circlet Press coupon code. Use FLESH to get a big discount when you buy like Myth Made Flesh on the circlet.com website. And if you go to the site after that code has expired, use Nobilis2016 to get 20% off any ebook at circlet.com. Remember to check the show notes at nobilis.libsyn.com for details on the release of Monster Whisperer on December 8th and the big podcast live event on December 11th. You have been listening to the Nobilis Erotica Podcast. The music is composed and performed by Mass Relay. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time, listen hard.